out, you might be wondering a little bit about that prayer about sending out an, uh, you know, an apostolic witness. But uh, this is a teaching sermon and to a large degree, and I, uh, I, my hope is that you understand uh, that prayer uh, by the time uh, I'm finished with this message this morning. We are in Romans, but also we are in Ephesians today. This is a little bit different uh, message because I'm going to, yes. Is it really? That's because the shirt is brand new. It's a really nice shirt. Yeah, it's because the shirt's new. And I, can you believe that? My wife didn't see that. Yeah, I want you to get it. Okay. There's a tag on the back of my shirt. How come? <laughs> why, why didn't? Listen, listen, ha, Chrissy, thank you. Why didn't, why, no, Christy, my, my wife, Christy, who's not here at the moment, didn't see it. Why didn't you see it? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You're so awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, it'll be on the video, right? Well, hey, you know what? Those in video land out there, uh, you, uh, you, you can know that I am very human, very, very human. Okay, so we are in Romans chapter 1, but we are also today in, uh, going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. But uh, this morning, let me begin with, with uh, Romans 1, 1 through 5. Uh, Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised before and through his promise in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is descended from David, according to the flesh, and designated son of God in power through the Holy Spirit the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to, to uh, take this word and uh, lift it up. As I prayed earlier, just carry it forward uh, that there would be an apostolic witness throughout this country. We need that. We need that desperately. Uh, that you would develop more churches and raise up people and existing churches to take the gospel, the good news, to the world. Amen. Amen. So, so this morning, uh, I want to begin with the uh, Pinterest Society. Uh, now, I'm not a big Pinterest user. I notice it's going to be like this, okay? It's going to be like this. The uh, Dominantly. Now, it may not be entirely true, but dominantly it's going to be more the, the women in the, in the church that respond to this particular opening. Uh, Pinterest has been around, well, it began in 2010, which, you know, I mean, that makes it seven years that it's been around. That is ancient stuff for the world that we live in, right? And technology, they've been around a long time now. Uh, and they have taken off uh, the Pinterest world. Uh, I'm wondering if there are super moms and super women in this church that want to, you know, that are engaged in the Pinterest society and, and that really want to be that super mom, that super woman. I wonder if you're one of those. Uh, according to social media, you absolutely need to be a part of the Pinterest society because in, if, if you're part of Pinterest society, you're going to learn all kinds of things. You're going to learn uh, how to choose the right photo, of course, right? You're going to choose, uh, learn how to, how to cook the right meal, uh, dr how to dress your children, dress your husband, you know? Uh, you're going to learn how to decorate your home in the right way. You know, my, my wife is really into this stuff, okay? Um, I, you know, the question today is, you know, women, can you keep up with the Pinterest Society? Can you really do it? Can you keep up with it? You see? And, and if you're wondering what I'm, what I, uh, what I'm saying, I, I read a quote from a woman named Catherine Stone this week. And, and this is what really, you know, tipped me off to this uh, sermon opening. Uh, she says this, and I, I think I put it on the screen. Yes, I did. The Pinterest Society of looking at all these pictures of people who have perfectly decorated homes, and reading on Facebook about children, because Facebook's involved in this too, of course, uh, who are always perfectly dressed and way ahead of all development miles, development, developmental miles, milestones, it puts a lot of pressure. I don't know if you feel that way or not, but it puts a lot of pressure on mothers, especially those who feel vulnerable and not fully confident in themselves. Now, I have been watching you, and I know that some of you, at least some of you, you know, don't feel good enough about your lives, right? I know that about the church. It's true. Of course, it happens everywhere. 
certainly with some of you. And I think Cindy hit it right on the nose last week when she preached. When Cindy preached and she said this, if only, if only, if only. So there we go. If only I was good enough. Now, it's not just about women, is it? It's about men, too. It's about all of us. If only I was good enough. You know, men, you know, are always saying to themselves, well, if only I had a better job. If only I made a little more money. If only I got a little more respect. If only, if only, and only. That's, the, that's what a lot of us do, right? So it's both women and men. The heart of this is the, is the seems like the futile pursuit and endless pursuit of perfection. We want to be perfect. We want to be perfect. It's so, it's so important to us. Now, I'm not talking about what we call in the church Christian perfection. That's another, another uh, uh, issue. It's another subject, and I'll, which I'll mention a little bit later. But I'm talking about worldly perfection. Making sure the world is impressed with us. Making sure that we have a place in the world. Uh, I mean, we don't want to be second best. Now, I love sports. I'm too into sports. I don't know what it is, but I'm just like, I'm, you know, I, I think someone told me the other day that, Paul, the fact that you love sports so much, it saves your manhood. You know, because, no, someone actually said that to me. It saves your manhood because you're not really, you know, you're not really into hunting. I respect hunters. You don't spend, you don't, I like to fish, but I don't spend much time. To, it takes so much time to do that, right? I mean, I, I only have so much time in my life. Uh, someone actually told me it's, this sports thing saves my manhood. Some of you would probably say, wow, you know, uh, I'm not into sports, but I'm into the other things. Well, you know, whatever. I mean, but, but the point is, is that uh, in, in sports, we're always looking at, you know, we're always comparing each other, right? We're always got to be better than the other guy or our team's better than the other team and so forth. So perfection is a big deal, worldly perfection. Uh, it's not something we should really be shooting for. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, but here's the thing. It's not just that we, we want to be perfect or win in one thing or, or, or so forth. It's really that we want to win in everything. That's what the world wants to tell us, right? That we, we need to win in everything. Uh, the famous French artist, uh, Eugene Delacroix, uh, he, he said this once. He said, he said, artists who seek perfection in everything are those who cannot attain it in anything. Pretty tough to be perfect at everything, right? I mean, as an artist, if you just limit it to being an artist, it's tough to be perfect in everything in terms of painting. Uh, we need to apply this to our general lives because for many of us, we don't seek perfection in one thing. We seek perfection in everything we do. Uh, some of us want to be, you know, the best, the best cook for our family. I don't know. I mean, whatever, you name it, right? But we don't want to be just that. We want to be this. We want to be able to have the perfect house or whatever it is. Uh, we want perfection in everything. See, we're just never good enough. We're never good enough, no matter what. As if our place in God, as if our place in Jesus Christ depended on us being perfect in a worldly sense. You see, and it's just not, just not true. Uh, every, uh, this last week, I put on Facebook uh, a post that reads like this. We don't need factotums in the ministry. Rather, we need each one to know his or her place in the body. Now, I didn't get much response from that. I got a little. I'm surprised I got any. But I got a little response. I didn't get much, okay? Because, you know, the word factotum is not used that often, right? Uh, factotum, uh, this is our little vocabulary uh, lesson for today, all right? It'll give me grace, right? You're going to give me grace to do that? Give me a little vocabulary lesson? Some of you go, yeah, Paul, I already know what this means. Others say, no, I've never heard the word. Well, factotum comes from the word fascio in, in Latin, which means um, it, it means to make or to do, like factory, right? To make or to do. And then totem is, simple, is also a Latin word that means, you know, um, everything. Or not, not everything, but kind of all or whatever. Everything, all, that kind of thing. So a factotum is someone who does, does well at everything. is able to do everything, able to make everything, able to, you know. So we don't need factotums in the church. We don't need people who will do everything. We don't need that. We need people who know their place in ministry, right? Uh, you know the person who does it all, don't you? Have you seen the person who does it all? Uh, I've seen the person who does it all. I've seen pastors who do it, do it all. And you know what happens to those churches, pastors that do it all? They go nowhere. 
Because a pastor has to be, you know, controlling this and controlling that and has to be on every board and every meeting and has to make sure that, you know, every little thing is taken care of and there's no delegation going on. There's no lifting up. There's no equipping for ministry uh, with uh, pastors who are like that. Uh, it, it's, it's just the way it is. I've also seen lay people who are factotums that want to do everything, all right? Uh, they want to have their hand in the music ministry, but they also want to have their hand in keeping up the church grounds. They want to have their influence on the chil in children's ministry and the youth ministry. But this is where it really happens. A lot of them want to act, have, uh, have influence on, on boards, and so they make sure they're on every possible board or show up for every possible board. And, and I, don't, you know, I don't know why they do this, but there are people who think that they are really good at doing everything. But a church can never be healthy with people that do everything. In fact, uh, some of you, if you got really involved in the church and you started doing lots of things, one of the things you're going to hear from me is stop it. I'm sure I can get a witness from some of you who've been around me enough who tend to want to serve, 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 serve too much. I don't want you doing that. It's not right. It's good to serve. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's good to serve. But we can do too many things. Isn't that true? We can do too many things. And then what happens? The other parts of our life, of our lives become unhealthy because none of us can be that way. We're not designed to be that way. So here's the thing. Jesus wants our, our, uh, wants our ministry to be healthy, wants our church to be healthy, wants you to be healthy. And that means letting God be God, letting Jesus be Jesus. It means letting yourself serve, be used in the place where Christ has called you, in the place that Jesus has called you. Now, this is setting this this whole thing, this, uh, this message up, thinking about to serve in the place where Christ has called you. Not being a factotum, not trying to be, you know, worldly, a worldly perfectionist, but serve in the place where Christ has called you. That will take us to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I've been in Romans for a while, I'm really getting a long way, I'm all the way to verse 5 again. I've already preached two sermons on verse 5, or out of two, verse 5. Well, guess what? We're still there, right? So what does verse 5 say of, of Romans? should be up on the screen. Through whom we have received grace, that was one sermon I preached, and apostleship, apostleship, I preached on that two weeks ago. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Uh, I now, I focused upon that word, like I said, a couple weeks ago, apostleship. And yet the Lord spoke to me and said, you have to speak more about apostleship. And you have to tell the church about apostleship in the context of Ephesians chapter 4. So that's where I'm going. I am absolutely certain that the Lord wanted me to give this message. And some, to some of you, you'll say, but it sounds like a familiar message. The Lord said, speak this again. Teach the church. Okay, so, so Ephesians 4, and, but I'm going to back up to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Now, just so you know about Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about in the beginning about basically what God has done to establish the church. He's taken us out of this world of darkness into the world of light. Uh, he's God, God has done this. God has done this. God has done this. Everything. And so Paul is so excited, and so he begins this, uh, uh, he talks about this, this prayer, and he gives us this prayer here, beginning with Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. What reason? The reason that what God has done, what God has, God has created the church. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through, the, uh, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, and that's a very important phrase there, grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ. There you see the word love again. 
that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I mentioned the fact that love is, is uh, well, I've highlighted it, I believe, on the screen. Yes, I did. Highlighted love. But Paul is really big on love. He's not big on he's I'm big on love in all of his ministry throughout everything he does. He you know he 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 says our aim is love. He gives us the 1 Corinthians 13, you know, uh, chapter, right? The the love chapter. Paul's big on love. Love is behind all this. He knows that God loves us. All right? And so and so God has saved people who are now part of the church, right? Who are in the church. But there's much to do. And, and so because God has done this, we have to, and we have all these people now that believe in Jesus Christ and that are saved. Paul writes this, this section in chapter 4 about what, what, what has been called the constitution of the church. How do we get along? How do we work together? How do we accomplish our goals? You see, this is what's going on. How do we accomplish God's goals for us? You see, that's really the issue here. And so Paul gives us this great chapter, and in verses 1 through 16, uh, it's, it, we can divide it into three sections, okay? And it really is all about love. It's written in there, all right? And, and so the first section here is, in Ephes is Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Uh, the first thing Paul says that has to happen in the church is there has to be unity for love. It's unity for love, really. So he writes this, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called into one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You are united in the Holy Spirit, in love, for love, however you want to put that, so that there will be peace. You're united, right? You'll be united, right? That's important because how many churches become divided? Uh, when, when people get into this perfectionism thing, where they have to be perfect from a worldly sense, they divide. Because if I have to be perfect in a worldly sense, that means I'm going for something that's probably better than what you do. Because I'm better than you at this thing, it creates a, a, a spirit of division, right? But Christian perfection is what? Christian perfection is about love. The heart being fully loving, being like Christ. And what happens when we are perfect in love? We unite. We're united with each other. I mean, we care. You're not going to say to me, oh, wow, you know, I don't like you because you love more than I do. You're not going to do that, right? If I love someone from a pure heart, where's the division in that? Where's the comparison in that? You know? It'd be like looking at Jesus and saying, well, Jesus, you know, you were so good, you know, dying on the cross for me, and I don't really like that because of the fact that, well, you know, I want to love more than you do. No one says that. I've never, no one's ever said that to me, right? Because love brings unity, unites us, right? So the unity, Paul says, starts off that, that way. Then he says this. He says, he says uh, in verses 7 through 11, he says, but grace was given to each one of us. And by the way, I titled this diversity for love, although the word love isn't in this particular, these verses. I think it's in the background. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And then check out verse 11, which is really where this sermon is going. Check out verse 11. This is about diversity. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers... Now, this is not division. This is diversity. There's a difference. And, the, and the, the real paradox here is that even though we are unified, there's diversity. That's the crazy thing, is that because of diversity or because of unity or how they two relate to each other, 
you know, somehow it all works together, you see. He gives the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want to go to this third passage. And the reason why I'm giving you so much scripture this morning is because I want you to have context for understanding verse 11 of chapter 4. I want you to know, Paul talks about unity. Well, first he prays for the church. Then he talks about unity. He talks about diversity. And then he talks about maturity. There's a, you know, God wants us to go somewhere personally and corporately. He doesn't want a church that's just maintained. I think that must be a pastor's biggest fear of going to a church, a new church. What do they want me to do? They want me to just maintain that place? Or they want me to actually lead them to maturity? You see? Uh, I would say, not, at least, I, I'm, now I don't know the statistics on this one, but I'm going to guess. I, I mean, I've been around long enough to, 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 to kind of pick this one up. I would say at least 90% of churches in America are all about maintaining the budget and maintaining the basic ministries. Just keep it going, you know? I mean, they'd love to have a pastor who grew the church, but as soon as you grow the church, all of a sudden you have problems. You just do, right? Because you have new people. Oh, no, they may not be like me. Oh, no. It's the way it is. So let's get a pastor who can maintain the church that the people will like and that they will give in a, in a good way. But, you know, Paul's not into that. Paul's into growing Unity, diversity, maturity. Here it is. Here it is. Maturity. Verse 12. Why does he give these apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers? Why does he do this? And then he says this. To equip the saints, that's you and me, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Be mature humanhood if you want. It's interested in the humanity, the, the ch- people in the church being, being mature, to mature manhood, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love. He's got to bring love back in. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by, by every joint in which, uh, um, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it binds itself up to love, or up in love, I should say. Okay? So there you have it. Hopefully this gives you some context, context for verse 11. And of course, verse 11 relates to what? Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Super important to see that. Okay? Question is, how does Ephesians 4, 11 relate to Romans 1, 5? I told you this would be a teaching sermon. How does it relate? How do those two connect? They're different letters and so forth, but they do connect. I want you to notice this. Okay? We're going to read this again. Through whom we have, verse 5, of Romans chapter 1, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, okay, for the sake, or, or to bring about the obedience of, of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Notice that 1 5, Romans 1 5, is distinctly about what? That which happens outside the church. Now, it, it does it relate to what happens inside the church, don't get me wrong, especially when we talk about grace. But it's very much focused, more focused on what happens outside the church. You think, think about that for a moment, okay? He says it's for the purpose, grace and apostleship, or, or for the purpose of what? Bringing about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name where? In the church? No, it's not his point. For the sake of his name among all the nations. That's an outwardly focused statement, and I have an announcement for you. I know you're going to be shocked by this announcement. I'm going to say it. The obedience of faith is not being lived out in all the nations of the world. Is it shocking or what? No, you know that, right? The obedience of faith is not happening throughout the world. There are little pockets of it, right, where the church is healthy, but it's not being lived out. And the result is, is that there is a lot more to do, a whole lot more to do. 
And so look at, look at verse 5 or verse 11 of uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians. Okay, and think about how these two things relate. 1, 5 in Romans being very outwardly focused. And now look at what he talks about in verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Now immediately, immediately I hope you see that there are three gifts there that were but in, by their nature or outwardly focused. Now, one of them is kind of an in-betweener. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay, but there are three uh, gifts that are definitely uh, definitely have an outward focus, at least to them. Okay, um, two of these. Okay, we'll got apostleship. Clearly, is that we'll talk about that in a little bit. Definitely outwardly focused gift to the church. All right, we'll talk about two others here. Okay, uh, we're talking about prophecy and evangelism, all right? Prophecy and evangelism, all right? And, and notice this. Paul doesn't say in verse 5 of Romans 1, I hope you're with me on this. He doesn't say this, through whom I receive grace and apostleship and prophecy and evangelism to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his, uh, his name among all the nations. He doesn't do that, okay? And, and, and why does he do that? Well, I'll tell you that's the, why, the, why prophecy is not in there right away. I'll tell you why prophecy is not in there. Prophecy's primary function is truly is inward. It has a, very, it has a very outward function, but it has an inward function. In other words, inside the church. What is a prophet? What is a prophet? If you were in a class with me, I would, I would say, I would ask you, what is a prophet? And I would force you to respond. Well, I wouldn't force you, but, you know, I mean, I'm going to wait. Come on, someone here has got to know what a prophet is, right? Got to know? Someone knows what a prophet is? All right. Prophets are those people who are referred to as the keepers of the covenant. So when you read the Old Testament and you read about prophets, and they're all over the place, by the way, true prophets, not false prophets, true prophets are preachers or keepers of the covenant. They keep reminding people again and again and again that their responsibility is to keep the covenant. And so in verse 4, Isaiah chapter 1, one of the greatest prophets, Maybe, who knows if he's the greatest prophet, but one of the great prophets, right? Certainly, with a, I think, the greatest prophetic book in the Old Testament. It says this, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. He's talking about Israel. Offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Now, if I got up here on a Sunday morning, and my first words to you were this. You people have completely left God. What are you doing? You people are horrible. You people have forsaken the Lord your God. You're going to be judged. You want to throw me out? Most churches would, right? They want to throw me out. Because, ooh, ooh, wait a minute, we don't want our preachers saying that. Even if it's true, which is not true here. But even if it was true, whew, we want to get rid of this guy, right? So prophets are constantly in the Old Testament being challenged. They're constantly being beat up. They're constantly being, you know, ridiculed. Uh, they're constantly, they're, they're, these guys are thrown into prison and stuff, right? They're, 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 it's a tough, tough, tough life to be a prophet, all right? In the New Testament, what does it mean to be prophetic? Well, in the Old Testament, if we're talking about, uh, about keeping the people of God in line with or uh, the, that covenant, that came, uh, came, through, um, came through Moses. Then in the New Testament, there's a covenant that Jesus gives, and it's a covenant in his blood. Jesus Christ gives his life. He gives his blood. He bleeds. The sign of his death, right? Jesus Christ gives his life so that you and I could have a new covenant with him, be in relationship with him, right? And so there's this, uh, there, so prophets in the New Testament, prophets in the current church, in today's church, are supposed to challenge you to live a life that is fully committed even to the point of death, right? Tough people. But notice this also what prophets do. Now, here it is. They have an outward function because what is it that prophets do today in the church? They call the church to go out there. That's what they do. You know, if a church is too focused on itself, then a prophet needs to come along and say, 
get yourself out of here and develop relationships out there, develop small group ministries out there, do whatever it takes to develop prayer ministries out there, get yourself out there because that's what Jesus is calling us to do. And so prophets have an outward function as well as an inward function, but they speak to the church, okay? All right, so that's prophets. All right, how about evangelists, which clearly have an outward function? I mean, that's obvious, right? What do evangelists do? Evangelists are people who lead people to Jesus Christ and they connect others in the church to those people who are new believers. They're always building relationships. That's who they are. They're like your salespeople, right? Always building relationships between people out there and people in the church and sometimes people in the church, getting them connected and so forth. They're, they're essentially almost like your salespeople. They're, they're kind of like that, all right? But evangelism needs, this is what evangelists need. Evangelism need an existing organizational structure. This is what makes them very different from apostles. They need existing organizational structure in order to, what, build the church. We need evangelists to build this church. If there are not evangelists, then what's the church going to do? I'm going to tell you what the church will do. The church will grow only through this through taking other Christians away from other churches. That's not evangelism. That doesn't fulfill Christ's call on our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I want people to come to our church, people who are existing Christians. They come from other churches. I'm going to love them and embrace them and hope that they're part of our ministry here. All right? But I'm not going to go steal them. Nor should you ever, ever try to get someone from another church to come to our church because our church is better. Forget that. That is not what Christ wants from us. He just wants us to win people to Jesus, right? And if people need to be here because this is a church that can help them heal them, that's different. Christ may be calling someone to this church who's a part of a different church for other reasons. But we as a congregation never go out and say, oh, I really want that person. I'm going to grab them. It's called cheap sheep stealing, right? Right? Evangelism is not cheap stealing. It's not. It is not cheap stealing. It's not it. Sometimes we think that it is. It is not. It is not. Okay, so that's evangelists and prophets. Evangelists need an organizational structure to be effective. Okay? Now, there are two other uh, groups here, and I'll try to deal with them quickly because it's already noon. All right? Um, and I'll just briefly touch upon them. I could say a lot about each one, but... I'm not going to. The other two are shepherds and teachers. Shepherds you love. Boy, I sure wish Pastor Paul was more pastoral, more shepherdy. You know, I, I wish that Pastor Paul would just love us and embrace us. I want to see the pastor be such a good guy, you know. And let me tell you, there's a super important place for that in the ministry. People need nurture. People need to be cared for. Jesus is the great shepherd, right? It's very, very, very important. We need shepherds, right? Shepherds are, are, they are like almost entirely inwardly focused. That's not a bad thing. We need them, okay? And then there are teachers. You've got to love those teachers. I love teachers. Teachers are those who help you to think. Teachers are those who give you sermons on things like Ephesians 4, 11, how it relates to Romans 1 through 5, or 1, 5, right? Teachers are those who give you wisdom and understanding, Actually, I'm more of a prophet than a, than a teacher, to be honest with you. But the reality is, is that teaching is an essential ministry. And, it's, and, it's, and it's what God's brought me here to teach, as well as be prophetic, okay? But nevertheless, I'm not going to go on anymore about that. You have your shepherds and teachers, okay? I've got to focus on apostleship. And I hope you have a little patience, because the sermon maybe is going a tiny bit long. Apostleship is one of the fivefold gifts that Christ has given to the church to accomplish its love task. You remember Ephesians 1 through 4, I mean, uh, chapter Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 is about love. Really, it is. I mean, it's about unity, diversity, and maturity, but you got, if there's not love, it's, we're going nowhere. And, 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 and the, the gift of apostleship is given so the, so the church can accomplish its love task. These are the people who are organizationally minded. These are the people who know how to start a new ministry out there. These are the people who know how to plant a church out there. These are the people that you don't want. 
Probably. You know why? You know why you don't want them? Because they might take a couple of people from our church to develop a new church. And we don't want that, right? Because we want them to we hold on to the people right here. But you know what? All that matters is what God's will is. And, I, and we're a long way from planting a new church. I've got to be honest. We are. We need a lot more evangelism going on around here. We need a lot more development of the church. We need to pack out this place and so forth. But the reality is that apostleship is about going out there. And these are organi- organizationally minded people. And they're different than evangelists because evangelists need an, or- an existing organization, organizational structure. So it's like, Paul, why are you spending so much time on this? Because apostleship must be seen in light of the fivefold gifts of ministry that Christ has given to the church. And quite frankly, if you don't know which of these are dominant in your life, because I fully believe Christ has given each one of us a measure of these gifts. And if you don't know what your dominant ministry is in this area, apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, teaching, or shepherding, then you're just not going to be as effective in ministry, and you're not going to be fulfilling Christ's call on your life. And this church will not be fulfilling its call on its life and its existence. And so what do you do with a message like this? Well, I told you it was a teaching message. But I do have a couple of things here that I I think you uh, could really benefit from. Number one, know where you fit. Know where you fit in Paul's five-fold ministry gifts. None of us are meant to be factotums. We're supposed to know how to work together as a team to give up worldly perfectionism and embrace Christian perfectionism. So know where you fit in the church. Know your spiritual gifts. And definitely know which of these five that you have. That, that, that may cost you $10. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to tell you to go to the forgottenways.org. I told you that two weeks ago. Go to the forgottenways.org. You'll probably have to go to a couple different pages. Okay? Register and take the inventory. Okay? And then let me know what's, where you fit there. Are you more, are, are you prophetic? Are you a teacher? We need plenty of those. Are you evangelist? It'd be really nice to know who you are right, in this area. And then evangelists can get together with evangelists and prophets with prophets and teachers with teachers and talk about how we support one another. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is pray, 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 pray. Pray that God would raise up this church and raise you up too, but raise up, raise up this church for outwardly focused ministry. It's amazing what happens when churches really focus on what's going on out there. God takes care of what's going on in here. He just does, right? Third, it's the last one here. Make love. The love of Jesus, the love for Jesus, and the love for others, the foundational principle of your life. All of everything I've taught here is as of no value if, if love is not its foundational principle. You know? I may know a lot about church structures or teaching the word or whatever, but if I have not love, what good am I? And that's true for this church. So there's a teaching message there for you. There's a challenge. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to grow in these areas? It's one of those things, like, oh, wow, Pastor Paul kind of, kind of bored me. Or Pastor Paul talked about something that's really interesting to me. And I, you know, I might think about this. And, you know, and, and then you go home and then you just forget about it and go, huh, that was an interesting sermon. That was a good sermon. And then two days I ask you, well, what did you do with that sermon? Like, I don't even remember what he talked about. Or I just didn't do anything with it. But it was interesting. I don't preach up here for your interest. I preach up here so that the Holy Spirit would get a hold of your life and that you would change, be more like Jesus, and do his will. Hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called the church to love one another, to love you, and to grow up. Lord, these ministry gifts that you called me to visit once again are so important. And I just ask, Lord, that the people here would take this and run with it. Um, 
you have a lot to teach all of us, especially me. So, Lord, bless these people and bless this word. And we pray that you would be pleased with all the things that we do because more than anything else, we love you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.